Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. We're going to Bass Town today. We haven't reviewed a bass in a while, and this is one of the coolest Gibson Signature Thunderbirds that's ever been made. That's right, we're talking about the Nikki Six Signature. So if you're not familiar who Nikki Six is, he's one of the co-founding members, the bassist, and the primary songwriter of the hit band Motley Crue. I mean, those guys knew how to crank out the hits. Kickstart My Heart, Looks That Kill, Girls, 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 Doctor Feel Good, Take a Ride on the Wild Side, Shout at the Devil, probably the first song I heard of theirs, or at least knowingly knew was theirs. And same old situation, I mean, this band has a whole lot of good songs, so if you're not familiar with them, definitely check them out. But this was his third signature bass within the Gibson family of brands. We'll learn about the other two here in a minute, but let's go ahead and get this bad boy open. Because if you guys remember, I purchased one of these a couple of weeks ago. It was advertised as mint condition, and then the day that one arrived, this thing came and was just a little bit better looking. So here is the other Nikki Six Thunderbird bass. Oh yeah, this one's looking much better already. So what makes this Thunderbird so fascinating is the fact that it has flame maple wings to it and it's an all red finish, it's a satin finish. This one has not been played as much so it hasn't been buffed into a gloss but look at the flame maple figuring on these wings, that's nice. It still has neck through construction here and we've got so many unique features about this one. But before we get too far deep into this one, we need to learn about his first signature base. So circa 2001, Nicky gets his first signature Gibson bass. He calls it the Gibson Blackbird. In fact, even up on the truss rod cover, it was called Blackbird right there. And as the name implies, Blackbird, he had a flat black satin finish on it with an ebony fretboard and really cool cross inlays. It featured a clear pick guard with a Thunderbird design on it and was also neck through and featured an on off toggle switch without any volume or tone controls and his signature opti grab. So the opti grab is like what you're seeing right here. He uses this to anchor the guitar down so he fights the neck diviness of these instruments. And then after that, they ran an Epiphone version, which we documented in the Trade Tuesday series, if you'd like to check that thing out. Basically, it looks very similar to the Gibson Blackbird, except for it's a bolt-on neck construction, and obviously the wood quality not quite as good, but it was a pretty nice little bass. So then, bam! Around 2008, they introduced these things for a couple of years. The... Thunderbird bass. So as far as I could tell, there was no fancy name for this one. They just called it a Thunderbird because the other one was called the Blackbird. But it has those very unique features like I was telling you about earlier. It still has the neck through construction, but instead of mahogany wings, it's the flamed maple. So kind of like those Guitar of the Week Firebirds and whatnot. It was probably slightly influenced by that would be my guess because Guitar of the Week was in 2007, one year before these guys. So our pick card's a little bit different this time. It's a mirror reflective one that says Nikki Six. It's got the double X's. And then instead of cross inlays, he decided to do his Nikki Six X's on the fretboard as well in a red perloid material. They look pretty sweet. We do have the raised headstock on these guys with a red Gibson logo on our truss rod cover. But perhaps the biggest change about these things is it still has the on off switch. So kind of like a kill switch, very similar actually what you would find on the Joan Jett signature melody makers. But due to popular demand, uh, he decided to put volume and tone controls on this version. And perhaps the best feature about this entire thing, in case you missed it, our sweet snakeskin case, kind of like what you'd find on the Voodoo series of Gibsons. So this kind of took the Voodoo elements, but put it in his own signature bass. And it is one of my favorite bass guitars that Gibson has created here. Now, as far as additional case candy, do we have anything? Yeah, it just looks like a owner's manual, typical pre-pack checklist type stuff and a truss rod tool, but yeah, Definitely glad I decided to pick this one up. I mean, it just amazes me how people's definition of mint greatly varies. But to learn a little bit more about the parts and specs of this one, let's throw it on the workbench to take an individual look at them. All right, let's go ahead and check out the specs of this one. So when you take that pick guard off, this is what you're left with. It's kind of a shame they had to cover up that entire flame maple side. I almost would have preferred it just to not be routed right here. Because if you really think about it, they could have got away with a channel route right here and not have to have it exposed. But look at that. Bad day at Gibson. Big chip out right there on that route. Then when you look at these pickup cavities, yeah. You can definitely tell when you're in a Henry J era guitar. Like that 2010s until the end of his. Dull router bits splintering not cleaned up too good 
That's just how they were. I can't quite make out what that says. It looks like a B-A-N something. And maybe B-C in here for like black cherry. I don't know. But it is interesting how they do that step down route. I don't believe I've actually had a Gibson Thunderbird before. This is the first time I'm looking at these pickups anyways. So they look like this on the front. They have the plastic coating. That's not how the true vintage ones would look. But look at that. It's all epoxy coated in there. So I don't think you could take this cover off unless you do some real damage to it. And just like P90s, they use a spring and a screw system to set your pickup height. As far as our pickup readings go, I guess, to be honest, I, I don't know what's going on here. We don't have a toggle switch, so it just appears to always be on. If that's really a master volume and a master tone, it, it just looks like you get one tone out of this thing and it reads about 4.75k ohms. So that's the on position. That is the off position. But now while we're talking about the pick guard here, let's take a look at that. So it's a mirror reflective surface right there, and it reads Nikki 6 and has the double X's, just like you're seeing on the fretboard. Now how do they do that? They just spray the back of it red. It's a transparent layer right there. So that just makes it appear red. Looks pretty nice. As far as our controls, this one does have controls, as we were talking earlier. Master volume, master tone, then your on-off toggle right here. As far as our bridge setup, it's kind of a cool triple post. So the bridge itself looks like this, vampire-esque, but it has these three areas. So you can raise it up like that, or a little bit lower, a little bit like this, like a normal tailpiece, or all of them at the same time. Makes it extra secure. Then you've got our four saddles right here. Be careful if you take this off. They do fall out very easily. And the back just looks like this. And now the OptiGrab. That thing was hard to take off. It's definitely a little bit different than the Epiphone version of this. It's got this plastic coating over all of it. So we all know plastic and nitro finishes do not get along together. So not only did it impress the finish, it was like reacting to it to the point where I could lift this entire thing up without screws. But I eventually took some power to the side right there and it was able to detach it so we could take a look at it. Nothing too fancy, but it's just a little bracket right here. I love the flame maple on this side. It's very active too, which is rare considering the fact that this is a satin finish. Like, gloss finishes make these things dance in the light a lot, but a satin finish, you have to have some extreme figuring to still make it through that. So that's pretty cool. Also having the neck through construction, a little bit hard to see because of the red, but you can see the different walnut layers in there. Also notice how this is a little bit more flat right here because of the maple wood grain, whereas over here you can see more of the pores of the wood because of it being mahogany. But moving on from our maple wings and mahogany neck, we continue up the neck and okay, there's a little bit more to the story on this. So I told you earlier, this base had an ebony fretboard. If you have one made in 2011 or before, this particular one is a 2012. And if you know anything about Gibson history, after 2011, Ebony does not exist. Not until about mid 2019, outside of like really limited edition custom order type stuff. So the one we're documenting today is a rich light fretboard. So whether you want to avoid post 2011 Thunderbirds like this one or want to embrace it because of the good qualities of rich light, I will leave that up to you. But this one is rich light. This has a 34 inch scale length and 20 frets, tiny nut width of 1.5 inches. That increases to a beefy 2.07 by the 12th with a first fret neck depth of 0.84 and it chunks up to 0.97 by the 12th. Here's that neck profile at the first fret and the 12th fret. You can see just how wide it gets. Here it's so slim, of course it feels like a super rounded neck, but then by the time you get up here, it just kind of flattens out, but has almost like a D-shaped neck to it. Not exactly, but kind of gives you that feel. And now our headstock. I'm gonna advertise this one as limited adjustability in the truss rod. I mean, a couple of threads sticking out is not too bad. I mean, maxed out is about like right here. And it wouldn't even surprise me if it left the factory set up like that. Sometimes it happens. I've documented enough cases in the custom shop, but never once in the Gibson USA plan. So it's also possible somebody's been cranking on that thing. Future Trogla here. Yeah, this thing was almost unplayable because it actually had an up bow in the neck. So I had to back off that truss rod just a tad, and now it's playing a lot better. However, a professional setup would definitely be needed if somebody wanted to gig this collector's edition. I would suggest this one for a collector though, because I'm looking 
And it's really hard to find these that don't have areas of the satin finishes that get buffed into the gloss because that's just what happens when you play these things for even a very small amount of time. Like if we want to get really nitpicky, there's like a small area right here just barely starting. And you've got some light marks on the headstock from string changes, general tuning, like maybe a, a small ding right there. That also could just be wood grain. It's kind of hard to tell because you got a lot of that going on too. But your truss rod cover ultra thin not really that nice to be honest but <laughs> it's got the red gibson logo on it the nut was particularly terribly cut on this one i mean look at how uneven those edges are Jeez, easy enough to reshape yeah but i mean this is a very good example of what you could have expect to have came out of the factory brand new in 2012 because it's been preserved very well Moving on to the back, very clean condition as well. I see like maybe a small impression right there. It's also possible it was just not sanded evenly at the factory. But again, love the figuring on that flamed maple. Here's what we've got in our control cavity. Just two Gibson branded pots. You've got your kill switch with your output jack located on the side. It appears these came stock with strap locks from the Schaller variety. As far as additional wear, I do see a small ding right here. I suppose, full disclosure, there's a small one right there on the top as well as right there by the output jack. So that's always my rule. There's no such thing as an absolute mint guitar. If you actually look, you can find some small stuff, even brand new. Now we'll run up along the neck here. This is definitely very respectable condition. But here you can see, made in 2012, our serial number dating it to the 172nd day of the year. We've got Grover tuners. So what else do I have to add to the uh, factory boo-boos? They've over-tightened that screw and that screw so it never fully secures. Now thankfully, the only purpose of that is to keep the tuner in place. The most important bit to have tight is right here. And when I got it, even this bottom strap button doesn't fully secure. Another one is, it looks like maybe there's some delamination of the lacquer along the edges of the fretboard like you can see that right there then going up the edge you see another small spot right there and the rest of this is looking okay but then the treble side's got a whole bunch more of that so i'm not really sure what's going on there but it's present so not gibson's finest work as far as the nitty-gritty details go but still a nice collectible example all said and done though, this one weighs just a little under 9 pounds, 8 pounds, 13.8 ounces. Let's go ahead, plug it in, and hear how this one sounds. I'll be running it through my computer because I do not have a bass amp. Alright, let's go ahead and get a basic tone out of this.
Now that we know all about the Nikki Six Thunderbird, what are my final thoughts on this thing? I don't do much for bass guitars, but this is still one cool looking bass. So is this a super bass guy review for this? No, it's more so a guitarist appreciating a really cool looking Thunderbird bass. It had some interesting tones in it. I'm sure it would sound better with an actual amp rather than being run through Logic Pro directly through an audio interface. But hey, this is a fantastic example here. So I hope you guys enjoyed taking a look at it with me. From the flame maple wings to the very interesting pick guard design, as well as the X's on the fretboard, it's a mean looking Thunderbird. All right, troglodytes, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.